We're diving into week number one of a series called Revelation. If you would, grab your Bible and turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter number one. And we're going to jump into this today. I'm so glad that you're joining us. Guthrie, love you all. Excited to have Gary Nelson in the house with you there. Also, Freedom House in Lexington, Oklahoma City. Everybody watching online. Revelation chapter number one. We're going to pick up with this amazing, amazing book. And start with verse number nine. It says, I, John, am a brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. Those represent the seven churches. And standing in the middle of the lampstands or churches was someone like the Son of Man, who was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a fire, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Somebody say amen the reading of God's word. Father God, we thank you, and may these words penetrate our hearts and produce action in our life as we follow after you. I pray this in your name be it done, and everybody said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Has anyone ever had like really crazy, wild dreams? Anybody? I mean, you wake up like, what did I eat before I went to bed? That was, that was bad. Well, John is having more than a dream. He's having a revelation. It's a vision that no one other than Jesus could give. Jesus gives him this revelation. I was reading this past week a guy that was a well-known theologian named John Calvin, who was one of the early leaders for writing commentaries on the Bible. And he wrote commentaries, complete commentaries, for 65 books of the Bible. Only one of them he did not write a commentary for. And guess which book was that? Revelation. He was asked, why is it that he did not write a commentary on the book of Revelation? And he said to his crowd, he says, because I don't get it. Anyone who tells you they've got Revelation figured out, they ain't got it figured out. I'm not against the commentaries. I'm not against, but to be able to say that I've got, because there's a lot of guys out there and you listen to like, man, they got this thing all figured out. No, they don't. They're speculating. They're speculating on some things. You see, we can read this book and get lost in its imagery. We can get lost in its otherworldly 
beasts and creatures and things that blow our mind. The seraphims flying around and many eyes and a beast. And we can begin to try to figure out all the things concerning the beast and the antichrist and the number 666 and the end time dates and events and so on. We can get so enthralled with them that we can miss the overarching message that Jesus is trying to give his church. You see, this book is first and foremost written to seven churches that were real churches with real people. Many of them facing suffering and all of them would be facing great persecution. And John is writing this book to encourage them. John knew a lot about suffering himself. He knew about persecution. In fact, he even said it here, I'm a, I'm a fellow sufferer with you in Christ Jesus. And then he breaks it down and says, you know, literally I was banned to the Isle of Patmos. For what reason? He said, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, church history bears out that John the Beloved was literally taken by the Roman government, imprisoned for a long period of time, and then was put into a pot of oil. The fire was put underneath it. It was heated up till it was boiling, and yet he didn't die. They took him out of that and realized we can't kill him, so they banned him to the Isle of Patmos and left him there, and it was on the Lord's Day that he has this revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, because during this time, there was a lot of persecution and it was actually starting to increase. We're talking close to 100 AD. And it was only picking up as the Roman government was pressuring Christians to recant their faith. And many of them, many of them by history, by the Roman government, history, historians, and also church history says they did not recant their faith. Faith. Some of them died horrible deaths. The apostle Peter died by crucifixion. But he did not want to die like Jesus, upright, so he asked that if he could be turned upside down. So instead of being died down with his head up, he died with his head down, crucified for Christ. There was others that were sawed in two. Some of them were taken and hung by their fingers and left for the elements for days in until they died. Some were, had holes drilled in their head with molten lava poured inside. Some of them were actually impaled on sticks, put into city squares. They were pitched and tarred, and then they were led aflame so that the Roman citizens could have light at night. These are true stories of people who refused to recant their faith and held on to their belief in Jesus Christ. I'm asking you, what are you standing for right now? Are you standing for Jesus, or are you wishy-washy and in and out? I'm telling you, Jesus is worth dying for. For over the last hundred plus years, the book of Romans specifically has been, I'm excuse me, the book of Revelation has been oftentimes viewed as a book of doom and despair and for fear. But for the early church, it was not written that way. It was written as a word of encouragement. But see, sometimes we can be so close to our suffering, like this Bible's right up to my face, but if somebody put this up to me and I did not know, I would not be able to tell you what it is because all I see is black. I cannot make out anything. I pull a little further from me and I can say, oh, it's, it's, it's a, maybe a book. I can see that it's a book. The further it gets from me, I can see that it's a Bible. And then I can see all the surroundings around me and I can see all the people. But with this up here, I can't. And sometimes suffering, sometimes pain, sometimes the attacks of the enemy causes us to see right here. And what John is doing through the revelation of Jesus is he's wanting the church to see the bigger picture of what is to come. Not just their present suffering, but what they will get in the end. And in verse number eight, he says it this way, Jesus, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is to come, the Almighty. What is he saying here? He's making a profound statement as he is God. He's always been God, he is God, and he will be God when everything is done. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's gonna be the same tomorrow. And he wants them to know that. And you see, that claim is a standing in itself. 
because he's saying he's God. Jesus is saying he's God. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about Jesus being a good man, a good teacher, and we can sometimes fall in that idea, but it cannot be true. C.S. Lewis said it this way, Jesus is no good teacher. Either he is one of three things. Either he is a lunatic of incredible proportions, or he is a liar straight from the pit of hell, or he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And each one of us have to make a decision on who Jesus Christ is. And someday every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. You see, and it says that he is Alpha. That's from the first letter of the Greek alphabet, the beginning, and Omega, the last F. F. And it, here's the thing. What is your beginning point will determine how you handle things in life. And if your beginning point is with you, well, good luck. If your beginning point is with, you know, your spouse or your parents or your kids or your job or your money, then good luck with that. Because it's going to come up sometime that you're not going to be able to have something to stand on because those things are going to not be there always. But if it is Jesus Christ, if he's your alpha point, and let me tell you something, Jesus is not the beta. He is the alpha, he is the omega, he is the beginning, and he is the end, and he's also everything in between. And if you know that he's your first and your last, then he can handle everything else in your life. In verse 17, he says it this way, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forevermore, forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the what? Grave. And in the book of Revelation, we can see all of this imagery, but there's some main thoughts that Jesus wants us to get that are key to be able to withstand whatever comes our way. And the first one, the first one I want you to get is this, is the warning against compromise. Jesus is warning the seven churches, which applies to our church today, a warning against compromise. And we've got a number of families in our church that come from um, outside of America. They come from another country. And oftentimes, English is not their first language. And they come here and either they learn some English, but obviously you're gonna learn it even more uh, when you get here, but they'll bring kids, or maybe their kids are born here. But it's interesting to note that their children, even though they are born of those parents, they end up not talking like their parents. Matter of fact, one of the big challenges for them to even maintain their language. When a parent comes and they have a small child, I'll tell them, say, you're gonna have to work really hard. And they'll say, oh, pastor, we speak our language, our native tongue in our home all the time. They'll get it. But they find out that they spend very little time with them, but they spend a whole lot of time in the school system. They spend a whole lot of time in culture. And let me tell you something. They end up being kids that like, they look like mom and dad. They're kids of their mom and dad, but they don't speak the same language or they don't even have the same dialect as their parents. Well, I've got a warning for you when it comes to following following after Jesus Christ. We are so surrounded by culture. We're so surrounded by our environments. We're so surrounded by media. It is so easy to be conformed to the image of this world. It's so easy to fall in the patterns of this world. But the Bible says, be not conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind into Jesus Christ. It's easy to follow the crowd. It's hard to follow one man named Christ. Broad is the way that leads to death. Narrow is the way that leads to life, following Christ. It's easy to give in to our comforts of the flesh, isn't it? It's hard to crucify our flesh. But the call of the book of Revelation is to die to yourself so that you can live unto Christ Jesus. It's following after Christ when no one else is following after Christ. It's being conformed to the ways of Christ. And in here, he talks to seven churches, and of the seven churches, five of them, he uses this word, repent. Five. I don't have time to go into all of them, but I'm gonna just pull out two of them real quick. One is the church at Sardis. Here's what he says. I know all the things you do, and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are, say it with me, Hold that, hold that right there, hold that. First off, he says, I know all things. 
Jesus Christ knows all things about you. He knows what you did last night. He knows what no one else knows. He knows your motives and the intents of your heart and the thoughts in your mind. And he says to them, I, you have a reputation for being alive. And the reason why I picked this one out as one of the churches I want to talk about is because North Church has a reputation for being alive. We got a live worship, hopefully live preaching and teaching. Hopefully we have live really alive and vibrant small groups and north groups and we got people that are energetic to give and world missions and all those things. But I don't wanna just have a reputation with this world that we are a church that is alive. I want to be looked at down by Jesus Christ himself and he says that we are alive. Because he really knows, because I have found that we can show up at church and we can go through the motions and really be spiritually dead. And here's what he says in verse two. He says, wake up. Wake up, wake up. You see, because every Christian, there's, on, there's one of three ways that you're either asleep spiritually or you're falling asleep spiritually or you're awakening spiritually. And I wanna be the Christian that's awakening spiritually. I wanna be the church that's always awakening. I wanna be the church that every time that somebody's preaching, I wanna be on the front row, on the edge of my seat, listening to that message, because I believe it has something for me. Every morning, I wanna open God's word, and I'll say, God, you got a word for me today. I wanna be awake to the realness of Jesus Christ. When we start worshiping, I want to lift my hands and go after Jesus, because I wanna be awake to his glory, his awe, and his splendor. I want to go out into the world and share my faith because I want to be awakened to what he's done in my life and I want other people to experience that. Amen. And then you have the church at Laodicea. Verse number 15 of chapter three, it says, I know all the things you do. Again, he says the same thing, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are lukewarm, water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, there's a lot of people that are debating on what that meant, and I, and I, I know you can take it probably from a, several different slants, but as I've read and looked at some theologians and some thoughts, I, I really believe that possibly Jesus was saying here, he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. What does he mean? Hot. Let's take that as you're on fire for Jesus. Come on, I, I want to be on fire for Jesus. How about you? but then or cold. What does he mean by that? Hmm. So Jesus had those that were the on, red hot on fire following him. But you notice Jesus also spent a lot of time with those that were cold. He went with the sinners and the publicans. He went with those that were the outcast of society and ate dinner with them and hung out with them because I think that he could stomach them a whole lot better than the lukewarm people. Because you know who the lukewarm people were? They were those that were the spiritual leaders. They were the Sadducees and the, and, and, and the Pharisees and the people that knew how to play the game. I don't wanna be a church that knows how to play the game. I wanna be a church that's on fire for Jesus Christ, living for him every day. Which brings me to the second overarching thought that Revelation is communicating. Jesus is communicating a call to faithfulness. A call to faithfulness. So of the seven churches, five of them were called to repent. Two of them were not called to repent, but they were called to remain. And to remain was simply this. He was warning them, don't go the ways of the other churches. Now, every one of those churches had something good. He said, he listed good things. And you see, that's what happens. That's what the scary thing is. So many times we can have a lot of good things we are doing that we miss out on where we're compromising. We miss out on our call to faithfulness. And God is calling us to raise up our level of faithfulness unto him. The call to faithfulness. He talks about the search at Smyrna. And they were, the Bible says, poor and persecuted. Poor and persecuted. And he says, remain strong. Remain. One of the early martyrs of the church was a guy named Polycarp. Polycarp was a bishop in Smyrna and also over that region. Polycarp 
Most believe this church history that he was a personal friend of John the Beloved who is writing this. And can you imagine John the Beloved is writing to Smyrna and some of his friends and he's sending out these letters and Polycarp is reading that message of standing strong. Don't compromise. Hold to your faith. Believe God. Trust God no matter what happens. And all of a sudden the persecution begins to come. And do you realize that Polycarp died, the, Bible, the, the church history says, and Roman history says, he died by the stake. He was bound. He was wood put around him. He was set on fire. But th when the fire did not consume him, they took spears and began to shove it into his torso and into his chest and into his heart till he finally died. But he never recanted Jesus Christ. May we be people of faithfulness that hangs on to the end. And then you had the church at Philadelphia, and it was a little church. All it says was little strength. You have little strength, but you have persevered. You were like the engine, the little engine that said, I can, I can, I think I can, I think I, I can make it. And it's interesting to me that of the churches that he had to repent, they were rich, they were increased with goods, they had all these things, but it was those that were poor, those that were little. You see, because sometimes we look at what we have on the outer as our source of maybe we're doing pretty good, but that's not how Jesus looks. He looks down deep inside. He doesn't care about your bank account. He doesn't care about your home. He doesn't care about your cars. He doesn't care about your name or reputation or where your education comes from. He says, do you have a relationship with me? That's what's important to him. And faithfulness to what? Let me give you just a few things to think about. A faithfulness first to the commands of God. What is the great command? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You so I, really, oftentimes, it would be how much easier for me to dive into the book of Revelation and determine some of the details of this book and then try to, try to interpret it than it is to love my stinking neighbor. <laughs> love my enemy that's attacking me and coming at me. You, you may know what I'm talking about. Amen. So it's easy for us as Christians to get, dive into the scripture and kind of begin to try to figure it all out. But when Jesus said, no, no, first thing I want you to do is love me and then show that by loving your neighbor yes. as yourself. Yes. And then also the command of the Great Commission. Faithful to that, he says. Faithful to the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? It's to go into all the world and preach this good news, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you. Making disciples is the call, folks. The reason why we do Heart for His House is because we want to do the Great Commission, taking the Word of God out to this world. But when I say that, don't be one of those Christians that simply says, oh, I'll, I'll pray and then I'll write my check and I will send the word out. No, 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 no. The, no, the, the great commission begins in Jerusalem and Jerusalem is your home. It is your workplace. It is the supermarket you go to. It is the gym you work out at. Everywhere you go, you should be taking the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus. Matthew 25, Jesus said that on the day of judgment, He's gonna say either depart from me, you work of iniquity, or he'll say, well done, you good and faithful servant. I wanna hear him say, well done. Which brings me to the last overarching thought that I wanna give you today, is the reminder of the ultimate reward. The reminder of the ultimate. Revelation is not only about a warning against compromise and a call to faithfulness, it's a reminder of the ultimate reward that is to come. So my wife and I got married 30 years ago. What was the reward for Mary and Shannon? Was it, was it a home? Was it somebody to cook? Was it kids? Was it somebody to beautifully decorate the house and a great leader in our church in regards to discipleship and does all these wonderful things? A beautiful, no, 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 no. You know what the reward was? Shannon. All those other things are just byproducts of her. The reward is her. And let me just tell you something. The reward for the Christian walk is not that my health is good. It's not that I got money in the bank account. It is Jesus. And even when we get to heaven and we're gonna have eternal life and we're gonna have a glorified body, all those things are byproducts. What the real reward is, is Jesus. 
To live is Christ, but to die is gain. To gain what? To gain Jesus in all of his glory, in all of who he is. And let me just tell you something. Jesus Christ is coming back. And throughout the book of Revelation, it says it again and again, he is coming soon. Jesus said he is coming soon. If they were saying that 2,000 years ago, how much more should we be awakened to the reality that Jesus Christ is coming back? And he says in verse number seven, he says, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven. That's his glory. Not through the clouds, he's coming with his glory. And everyone will see him, even those who pierced him, in other words, every single person that even stood against him, they're gonna bow their knee to his glory when he shows up. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him, yes, amen. Now for some people, the coming of Jesus Christ scares them spitless. And for you, I say one of two things. Either you just don't understand what really is happening here and you need a greater revelation of what God wants you to understand or you're still in your sin and you need Christ to redeem you from your sins. Because if my wife has gone on a trip for several months, I'm telling you, I am anticipating her return. I can't wait for her to get back. And the moment I see her, I am sprinting all out to get to her, to throw my arms around her, to give a big smack on the lips and just to hold her embrace because I have been missing her. And that's the way it should be with Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior should be that many more times over how we are anticipating and exciting about him coming back. He is coming again, but he's coming for a church that's without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. And do you realize that he's coming back to judge the world? Now, this scares a lot of people too. And it shouldn't. And for the church at Ephesus and the church at Laodicea, they begin to realize he's coming back to judge. The very end of this book, Revelation 22, verse 12, it says, look, I am coming soon. Again, he says that. Bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. And I find encouragement in this. Sometimes we can find fear in this, but not for the church here. They're, they're finding encouragement in this because what it's saying is that someday God is going to make all things right. What juries couldn't do, what judges couldn't do, what our leaders couldn't do, God is someday gonna do. Come on, sometimes as a pastor, I make judgment and I'm like, I really don't know what to do. And sometimes I have to make judgment, but there will be a God someday that's gonna judge everything right and he is gonna set everything right and we should find peace in that and hope in that our God is coming back to judge. But for those who are the righteousness in Christ, I got good news for you. All of your sins have already been judged by the cross of Calvary, and your sins have been cast as far as east are from the west, and you got to rejoice in that, that your sins are buried in the sea of forgiveness, and you will not be judged according to your sin. You will be judged according to your works, but in the flesh, but not according to your sin, and that is good news to know. So throughout this, in verse number five, he makes it clear. He says, all glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. How do we receive victory? The victory is through Jesus Christ in him alone. And to every one of the churches, all seven of them, Jesus says, to those who are victorious, I will give. And he says something different to every one of them. Now, this is not something that he's given different to every church. He's just given a, an example of all the things that will be given on that day when we are crowned the righteousness in Christ. And to one, he says, the ability to eat from the tree of life, from the fruit. You think about that for just a moment. I love fruit. How many love fruit? We're gonna eat from the tree of life. It says that the leaves on that tree are for the healing of the nations. That's good to know. He says for those that are victorious, that you're never going to taste the second death. In other words, you're going to live forever, ever. 
To another one of the churches, he said, you who are victorious, you're gonna eat from the hidden manna in heaven. I don't even know what that means, but I like it. And when I thought about the hidden man in heaven, he says, I got hidden manna for you that you're gonna eat in heaven. You know what I went back to? I went back to my Aunt Karen who loved me. And I'm telling you what, I was her favorite of all the, all the cousins and nieces and nephews. All the, I was her favorite. And I'd go over to her house and she would bring me over there, her kitchen. She said, hey, here's my secret stash. And she had, whatever she had baked, whatever she had made, she'd show me this little area, this little hidden little nook. And I would be the first one into it. Come on. I believe that what Jesus is saying here is that I've got something reserved for you, some food that no one has ever tasted. Not an angel has ever tasted. Come on, none of these seraphim and creatures in heaven have ever tasted, but I have reserved for the redeemed of the Lord. And when we get to heaven, Jesus is gonna take us back to his special little stash. He's gonna open up here, taste from the manna that no one has ever eaten. Come on, church, we got something to look forward to. Victorious, victorious. Clothed, what? In robes. That's what we get to look forward to. Pillars in the temple of God. But the last one is the most important thing. If you don't mind, give us some keys. The most important thing, I think, is that we're gonna sit. Come on, I like the keys. It adds to my preaching. Don't you feel the anointing level going up more? Yeah. He says those that are victorious will sit on the throne. And not just any throne, on his throne. With him. Can you imagine that? I've never been to the White House. And it doesn't matter who the president is, doesn't matter all that stuff. You know what? It'd be nice to go there, but it's that's that's not my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal and reward is to sit on the throne with Jesus Christ. That's what the goal should be. That's the ultimate reward. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. To sit on the throne with him. To rule and reign with him. And if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Now is the time. I want every eye closed and no one looking around. And if you're here and maybe you're wherever you are, but you need Christ as your Lord and Savior to make it into heaven. You need forgiveness of your sins. Don't flirt. Don't flirt with this world. Be crucified with Christ. And how do you do that? By dying to yourself and Christ coming alive in you. I want to pray a prayer. Father, may your Holy Spirit descend in this place to everyone that's listening. And may we cry out to you for forgiveness of our sins. And will you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Make us the righteousness in Christ. You died for us so that this could be the case. And then God, may we obey you by following you in water baptism. It's in your name I pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen.